I've spent the last 10 years of my life working on a book about the Vatican and the Catholic Church. So when I found out that the theme for tonight was no return, what immediately popped into my head was the sign that Dante says is hanging over the gates of hell, the one that says, um, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. I mean, if there is a point of no return, that's surely it. At the end of our lives, God sorts us into the saved and the damned, and there we spend the rest of eternity. Religion sort of has a reputation for this kind of binary thinking. Everything is either <laughs> good or bad, there's vice and virtue, things are black and white. But what I found along the way in the process of researching this book is that that's actually not the way that at least the Catholic Church thinks. In fact, we modern secular people, and I count myself in that number since especially as I started this book, I was an atheist. Um, we modern secular people are much more likely to think in binaries. Everything's a fact or it's fiction. Everything's true or it's false. Pluto's a planet. Pluto's not a planet. <laughs> Bruce Jenner's a man. Bruce Jenner's a woman. The, the, and the upshot of it is that I think we all sense here, and I don't mean to be flippant about that. I mean, I, in honesty, I think we all sense that these categories are unhelpful. That in a way, we're glossing over the subtle and nuanced importance of what's really there by constantly having to dichotomize things, right? And instead, the Catholic Church is much more comfor comfortable with a gray area in between, um, with a, a middle ground between black and white. For instance, many of you have probably heard of purgatory. Purgatory is this third realm of the afterlife between hell and heaven where you get a chance to work toward that eternal promotion. There's some fluidity in, in the system there. Uh, well, what I'm going to suggest tonight is that, in fact, this Christian willingness to say, this is mysterious, we don't understand this, God is a mystery, life is a mystery, truth itself is a mystery, is helpful in being able to recognize something about the nature of reality that I think otherwise we may miss. So let me start by um, explaining, well, let's start with a, a, a hypothetical. Why don't we start with this? Um, because I know this is a little bit abstract. Um, suppose that you are charged with a crime, but not in a civilian court, in a Catholic court. Now, you may not know that these things exist, but the Catholic Church has its own separate justice system. Every bishop in the world has one of these courts in which you can be prosecuted for anything from uh, desecrating the Eucharist to attacking the clergy to actually just murdering someone. It doesn't have to be anybody affiliated with the church. Just the crime, murder is a crime under church law. So theoretically, you could be prosecuted there for it. What kind of verdict might you face? Well, the judge could declare that you're innocent. The judge could declare that you're guilty. But the judge also has this third option that sort of gestures at the church's recognition that there's a gray area. And the Latin name of this third sentence, this third verdict that's possible, is sententia dimissoria, which means, according to the Vatican's own translation, that the judge is declaring himself to be, quote unquote, invincibly doubtful about what the truth is. Um, invincibly doubtful. So what does this mean? In a, in a common courtroom, we would just say this means that neither side, prosecution and defense, and by the way, these don't exactly exist in the same way in the Catholic tradition, but it means, you, you can imagine this meaning that neither side has really um, made its burden. Neither side has exposed enough of the facts for the judge to feel comfortable saying what the truth is. But it can also mean that the facts are out and the truth is just inherently mysterious. We have sort of failed to expose a unified truth. Truth itself contradicts itself. Truth is somehow inherently mysterious. Now this idea is so foreign to us, again, as modern secular people, that I want to dig down into this for a second. What, what does it mean that truth itself can be inherently uh, mysterious or contradictory? So here are a couple of examples that I came across in, um, in this 
less studied realm, uh, there's a subject here that I actually dug into pretty hard because nobody's ever touched it before, which is the history of Vatican crime. Uh, I spent about six months just digging around in newspaper archives because I wanted to see what actually happens in this place um, in the way of criminal activity. Um, no titters in the audience, please. Um, so, many of you probably know that the Pope has bodyguards. These are called, they're called Swiss guards. These are the men you see dressed in these rainbow colored uniforms, holding the medieval weapons, standing at the Vatican gates, um, which by the way is all theater. Uh, at night they wear blue fatigues and carry nine millimeter Sig Sauer handguns. But what you need to know about them for, for right now is that these men live inside the Vatican itself in a barracks that's just underneath the Pope's bedroom window. And in May of 1998, a 23-year-old vice corporal in the Swiss Guard walked upstairs in that barracks, knocked on the door of his commanding officer, and shot his commander in the head, and then turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Um, as you might imagine, newspapers everywhere said, that's shocking. We've never seen a Vatican murder-suicide before. This is unprecedented in Vatican history. But it's not. About 50 years earlier, a 23-year-old vice corporal in the Swiss Guard walked upstairs in that barracks, knocked on the door of his commanding officer, shot his commander in the head, and then turned the gun on himself. What are the odds of that happening? Now, what if I told you that 50 years earlier, it happened again, which it did on June 1st of 1897? There's a story in the Bible in which Abraham says to God, how many righteous men do there need to be in the city of Sodom for you not to destroy it? 50, 40, 30, 10? So let's put the shoe on the other foot. How many times would I have to tell you I had found weird coincidences like this in the history of Vatican crime for you to feel that there must be something more than coincidence here, that we aren't really adequately describing reality when we just say, that's weird. Because as it turns out, Vatican crime, the history of Vatican crime is littered with these sort of incidents. It turns out that pretty much every 31 years, someone puts a bomb inside St. Peter's Basilica. Exactly every 100 years, an art professor is caught trying to sell pictures that he cut out of an ancient manuscript at the Vatican Library. And every time, it is a manuscript of the Italian poet Petrarch. <laughs> we aren't really, you know, the modern, we modern people, we have, a, we have this expression, this chestnut that we throw around, that history repeats itself. Well, nobody believes that. Right? There's no scientific mechanism to explain how that could even happen. History to us is a series of unique, un, uh, unrepeatable, um, events so that when we're confronted by evidence like this, we don't have any apparatus mentally to be able to put this on a, belt, on a bookshelf in our mind. We just sort of um, chuckle nervously and move on, right? So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, about the nature of reality, that sometimes reality defies our expectations of it. So. Rather than ask you what your number is in terms of how many weird crimes I would have to tell you about before you would think this was legitimate, I'm going to be a little bit coy and instead I'm going to move into an even bigger puzzle that I came across along the way as another example of, of what I'm talking about. So again, this theme is sort of this gray area between black and white. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this subject in terms of the black and then the white and the black and the white. And the subject here is the Shroud of Turin. Now, part of the novel that I wrote is about the Shroud, and I've had some friends come up and say, I, this is a lovely book. Is there really anything new to say about the Shroud of Turin? I'm going to try to answer part of that right now. Um, first of all, for those of you who need a refresher, the Shroud of Turin is the most famous relic in Christianity. It's a length of linen cloth about 14 feet long, three and a half feet wide, and it purports to be the the cloth in which Jesus Christ was buried, meaning that after his crucifixion and before his alleged resurrection, 
This is the cloth that was wrapped over his body. And I say that it purports to be that cloth rather than that the church purports that it is that cloth because on that cloth is, by some mechanism we still don't understand, there is a magical image of a man bearing all the wounds of a crucified Jesus Christ. So right away we're sort of faced with one of these binaries. Either this is authentic or it's a fake. Either this is Jesus or it is what someone has tried to doctor up to make it look like it's Jesus. And before we begin, I do want to make it clear that um, my opinion on this is that the shroud is a fake. Um, to me, I've read a do dozens of books on this subject, but in a weird way, this ends up being a gut instinct. It, to me, it's just not a convincing image. There's something, it, it lacks the verisimilitude, sort of the naturalism that you, that you want to be, in order to be convinced that this is a true portrait, um, even a mystical portrait of a person. So for me, there are just very basic problems with the relic. But what's interesting is that the things I find problematic, other experts find very convincing. So I offer my black, my criticism, my skepticism, and in turn, here's someone's white. A medical examiner here in New York decided that he was interested in testing whether the Shroud of Turin accurately represents what happens to a person's body when he or she is crucified. So he collected a group of corpses, and this is a true story. He, I believe he did this in, the, in his garage. He crucified them. Um, I don't know what your background check situation here in New York is, but. Um, and what he found, and by the way, this is a very clever test, because for 1,500 years in Europe, crucifixion has been outlawed as a punishment, which means that presumably if someone, if some European concocted this thing in the last 1,500 years, the person who did it had no idea what a crucified body looked like. And in fact, probably assume that all the people looking at it would have no idea what a crucified body looked like. So there's just no incentive to work that hard at the fake. So here's a modern scientist coming in and saying, I'm going to check it out. And what he found was this. There is something peculiar that the Shroud of Turin gets right that most paintings of Jesus get wrong, which is that when you see a painting of Jesus, you've probably seen thousands of them, and when you see him crucified, he's always nailed to the cross through his hands. And I, I don't want to revolt anyone. I know some of you are still eating. But one of the findings of this medical examiner is that you can't do that. Gravity is your enemy. If you want that body to stay on the cross, you can't put nails through someone's hands because it won't stay up. Instead, you end up having to nail it through a set of bones in the wrist. And lo and behold, this is what we see on the Shroud of Turin. So there's a white to my black. Well, OK, so you say to yourself, all that means is that the forger did as much homework as the medical examiner. Fine, I get it, I buy it. Um, here's another contrast. History itself seems to argue against the shroud. The shroud appears out of nowhere in medieval France around the year 1350. And shortly afterward, the bishop in that part of France says, this thing is a fake. In fact, I know it's a fake because I found the guy who painted it and he confessed. That is pretty open and shut, right? In fact, we have a 600-year-old handwritten document from this bishop saying as much. So there's not a lot of wiggle room here. And yet, 100 years earlier, a French knight travels to Constantinople and writes a memoir about what he saw there. And one of the relics he saw hanging in Constantinople was none other than the burial shroud of Jesus Christ. In fact, a year after this, the imperial family of Constantinople writes a letter to the pope, which the Vatican still has, saying, a group of Catholic crusaders came and stole this relic and brought it home with them. What do we make of this? In the 1300s, we have a bishop saying, it's a fake. I know it's a fake. I met the guy who made it. He told me he made it. In the 1200s, we have a French knight, and we have the imperial family of Constantinople said, we're saying, it's over here. It's, I saw it 100 years before this bishop says it was a fake. So you think to yourself, okay, well, you know, making relics is a medieval cottage industry. This is what medieval people did, right? I mean, maybe the French crusader goes to Constantinople, sees it there, thinks, I'm going to make one of these back at home, and, and trots back to France, and that's how we end up with our modern Shroud of Turin. The problem is that the letter from the imperial family makes it very clear that what was stolen was not the idea of a shroud, but the shroud itself. Nevertheless, this is the kind of thinking we have to do as modern people 
in order to make truth dovetail, right? We're always looking for this sort of unity of truth. We deeply believe that what we're going to find out in the end is that all these stories can be woven together to form a single argument, a single hypothesis that explains everything. Well, let's cut to the chase. In 1988, the Catholic Church says we are going to allow the Shroud of Turin to be radiocarbon dated. They take a sliver of it off, and they cut it into three pieces, and they send it to three independent laboratories in three Protestant countries to have it tested. And those three laboratories all come to the same conclusion, which is that this thing is a medieval fake. It cannot possibly be older than 1260 AD. There's almost a 100% chance of this. In fact, one of the scientists involved in the testing goes on to say that given these results, the chance that this thing is authentic is one in a thousand trillion. Now, the number 1,000 trillion means about as much to me or has about as much reality to me as the question of whether Pluto is a planet. But you get the point. The scientists are really, really sure about this. So 1260 AD. The shroud cannot be older than 1260 AD. And before I say what I'm going to say, I do want to point out again, I've read a lot of books about this. I've read about the radiocarbon dating. I have every reason to believe, and I do believe 100% that these scientists got it right. They followed the protocol. They did what they were supposed to do. There is no chance that these three laboratories independently all got the wrong answer. And yet, 1260 is a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because of a little book that's kept in the National Library in Budapest. Uh, it's called the Prey Codex, and it's kept under lock and key because it happens to be a national treasure to them. This is the first ever use of the Hungarian national language. But the reason it matters to us is because it also contains a series of drawings showing Jesus being buried in his shroud. The resemblances between this picture and the shroud are very peculiar and in a way unsettling. First of all, the shroud in the picture is about the same length as the Shroud of Turin. The shroud is wrapped around Jesus' body in the same way that the Shroud of Turin seems to have been wrapped around Jesus' body. The posture of the body is the same, and this is very rare in medieval art. On both the shroud and in the drawing, Jesus is naked. And if you haven't thought about that part of it, this is a peculiarity of the shroud itself, and it's very peculiar in these pictures too. The drawing shows Jesus with his hands covering his genitals, as we see on the shroud. It also shows something very strange. In both the shroud and in this picture, you cannot see Jesus' thumbs. Now, if you flash back to the medical examiner in New York, one of his findings was that when you do put that nail through the wrist, you hit a nerve center that causes the thumb to involuntarily retract over the palm, making those thumbs impossible to see from overhead. Now, the weirdest thing of all is this. On the drawing, there are four tiny dots, what appear to be holes in the shape of an L. And on the Shroud of Turin, there are four little holes in the shape of an L. Nobody has ever been able to explain what these things are or how they got there, but they're there. So the conclusion is that whoever drew this picture almost definitely was working with pretty close firsthand experience of our Shroud of Turin, not some other shroud that someone else concocted after being inspired by a different shroud in some other part of the world. The very same cloth that we have today is the one that inspired this artist to create this drawing. And yet we know for a fact that this book, the Prey Codex, was made in the year 1190 AD. 70 years before science says the shroud could have existed. Now, the point here is not for me to convince you that the shroud is real. I've told you what I think about that, and I am sticking to my story. The point of this is just to say that maybe truth and fact and history they're not really as linear as we think of them as being. Maybe reality itself has a slightly more complex shape than we're used to. Maybe sometimes history does repeat itself. Maybe sometimes facts and truths cross by each other in the night without ever really converging. What interests me is not just whether that's the case. It's also whether we modern secular people can acknowledge it. Thank you.